everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, today I want to spill the beans on things I've learned writing a number of popular Ember add-ons and share thoughts on the four things that I think make an add-on good. So firstly, my name is Lauren. Uh, you might know me as Sugar Pirate. And my skills include dad jokes, ordering bubble tea for my colleagues and then drinking all of it, and being Australian. Because of these highly valuable skills, I work at Netflix on applications that power the world's largest studio. Uh, so come to our booth later if you're interested in what we're up to. So add-ons, chances are you've used one. Raise your hand if you at least one add-on in mind when I say good add-on. Oh, that's awesome, it's a lot of hands. So last I checked, there are actually more than three and a half thousand add-ons uh, in existence uh, if you check the emberaddons.com website. And in the beginning, when add-ons were first introduced, uh, it was actually really tough to write one because a lot of features didn't exist in both Ember and Ember CLI. Uh, and you, you know, <laughs> in the past, you had to resort to like hacks or intimate API to do certain things. But I think we can all agree that add-ons have gotten pretty great uh, over this time. But out of three and a half thousand add-ons, how many are good? This was the question that uh, made me think about uh, you know, this, this, this whole talk. And I have a very simple theory that there are four major things that go into, uh, contribute into what makes an add-on good. So firstly, the add-on needs to solve an interesting problem. It doesn't have to be an extremely difficult or challenging problem. Uh, something simple done well could still qualify as a, solving a useful problem but it has to solve it so well that someone else would, someone would rather use your add-on your add than to build it themselves. Secondly, it needs to be straightforward to set up and use, and that usually means good documentation, examples, uh, and a low barrier to getting started. And honestly, I think this is where most add-ons fall short. Third, the API needs to be delivered. It doesn't have to be perfect, uh, but you do need to put some thought into it, and it can't be an ad hoc API. And this is really tricky to get right on the first try, but thankfully that's why semantic versioning exists. And finally, it has to be reliable, uh, or in other words, it also needs a meaningful test suite. And this is especially true for add-ons that aren't presentational. Uh, you know, people want to use your add-on to solve problems and not cause more problems for their application. And a test suite is a good way to give people confidence about your add-on. So which add-ons for this bill? Uh, there are many, but these are some of the more popular ones. We just listened to uh, Mac T's talk about Ember concurrency. I, I have talked about it a lot. Uh, my coworkers are probably bored to death of me talking about Ember concurrency, but it's probably my favorite add-on so far. Uh, it's got really great documentation. The API is very simple, as you just saw, and it solves a really difficult problem. Ember Power Select is also an add-on uh, that hits all those four points, in my opinion. And you would think that a simple select dropdown, you know, it would be simple to build. It just, it's just a simple select, right? How can it be? But it turns out it's not that simple. Uh, but Ember Power Select makes it a really nice experience. Uh, Liquid Fire, of course, needs no introduction. Provides a very nice declarative DSL for you to uh, declare animations that were previously not possible. Uh, it's also very easy to use and very well documented. And finally, Ember CLI deploy. Uh, the, you know, deployment is so different across like different teams and companies, but Ember CLI deploy is flexible enough to handle all, or if not, I mean, sorry, most if not all of it, and it's also very extensible. And these are just some of the more popular add-ons. Now, when it comes to running good add-ons, I think there are many approaches, but personally, I like to practice DDD, documentation-driven development, when I make a new add-on. Documentation. <laughs> Documentation, okay, I'm not gonna do the whole thing. <laughs> and the main reason is that it helps me think ahead of time what the developer experience should be. You know, what kind of API does this add-on need to surface? And then from there, you start to write tests and you can do test-driven development against that API. Because it's true, if you don't document something, how will they know that it exists? Or how will they know to actually use this feature without spending hours digging through your source code? Some languages uh, even rightfully treat documentation as a first-class citizen. So this is Elixir, and the examples in the comments in gray, they can actually be run as tests. And unfortunately, this isn't a language feature in JavaScript, which is really sad. But documentation is so important that some add-ons even have their own dedicated documentation sites. 
while this is really nice to provide, by no means is it required. Uh, you can certainly have very decent documentation with a markdown-based readme alone. And this is typically the place you should start anyway uh, with, with documentation, and you can always visit making a fancy pants doc site in the future. If you are in the habit of commenting your code with uh, JS doc or UE doc style comments, then you can also find add-ons or other JavaScript libraries that will help you generate documentation. And uh, even if you don't, they are still a really good way of, uh, you know, teaching contrib contributors like how to contribute to your code. So let's say you've done all of that. You have an add-on that solves a really interesting problem. It's well documented, has a good API, and it's well tested. Now what? Well, in most cases, that's not sufficient by itself. And the thing is, and this applies not only to open source, uh, but generally speaking, projects require two things to be successful. First, it has to solve a problem, and if you've done those four things I mentioned earlier, you've already got this in the bag. But more importantly, building it isn't enough by itself, and you also actually have to convince other people to use your add-on or your library. And again, this is not only true for open source, but many things in life. There was this really great talk at ReactConf by Cheng Lo on the meta language, and what he, he describes as the meta language is uh, the stuff that goes beyond the code. So these are things like that, uh, like blog posts, videos, conference talks, documentation, uh, whatever else, a thought leadership would be a good one. These things are really important, but they're not codified into the library or the language. And of course, anyone can build an add-on, but the project doesn't end when you hit NPM publish. In fact, it's only just started. Luckily for us, there are many ways to spread the word. Uh, you know, you can write about it, you can record a talk, record a, yeah, you can record a video, you can do a talk at a conference, like MACD, uh, you know, and people do want to listen, uh, to learn about it, because no matter how mundane or technical or boring you might think it is, it's also a really important step in getting feedback so you can improve on this library. But if you're like me, despite being up here on stage, um, when I create new add-ons, I tend to write about them first. Uh, personally, for me, writing has the best ratio of effort to reward. Uh, you know, writing helps me communicate my ideas better, uh, but I think your mileage might, your mileage might vary. Uh, and as an aside, I'm still running this Emberway publication, so if you do want to write about something that you've written, uh, let me know, and I can help you publish it. So in this talk, I want to share my experiences and lessons learned writing add-ons, and hopefully I can also inspire you to start writing add-ons of your own. So first, let's take a quick look into what exactly goes into an add-on, and how to think about an add-on structure. So when you generate an add-on for the first time, you'll notice that the folder structure looks very similar to an Ember application. But one of the main differences is that it has an add-on folder, but otherwise, it mostly looks the same. And there are a few things to note, though. So on a high level, the add-on uh, application and test folder live in Emberland, and in these, in these folders, you're actually working in the framework itself, and uh, Ember CLI helps glue it all together. On the other hand, there are folders which are in node land, uh, or in other words, not in the browser, and these are all files that are used by Ember CLI when the add-on is installed into the consuming application. Now, in the add-on folder itself, you can think of it like a source folder for your add-on, and most logic lives in here and these files won't get merged into the consuming applications uh, tree unless you also export these uh, files in the app folder. As a rule of thumb, I only export things that are part of the framework, like components, helpers, services, and so on, or other parts of the, uh, the add-on that people might want to override. So here in this example, uh, we need to export this helper so that the user can actually use it in their template. But if the user has an append helper already in their application, then that will actually take precedence over the add-ons helper. So in that way, they can override an implementation if they need to. And this is really important to think about because you wanna be deliberate about what gets merged into the consuming application, and you don't have to export every single thing in the add-on folder, and it's often not recommended. And you can think of it like exporting is making something publicly available, so, and you don't really wanna make everything publicly available. Now, in scenarios where another add-on conflicts with yours, it is possible to specify which add-on will win. So here, uh, Ember Chainset Validations, which is a plugin for another add-on called Ember Chainset, it, the, these two add-ons both define a chainset helper, but I wanted the Ember Chainset Validations helper to win. 
so here you can, you, you can actually be very explicit and say that um, this add-on should be installed after Ember Chain Set, and therefore its helper will take precedence. One thing to note though is that even if you don't export something in the app folder, uh, it doesn't make it private. And consuming applications can still access it if they know the path to it. And it's very easy to see all the modules that Ember CLI knows about. I'm not gonna tell you what command you need to put in the console to see this. Uh, I'll tell you later if you want to know. Uh, but keep that in mind, so there's, there's no real concept of private modules here. In addition to the add-on and app folder, add-ons can also introduce blueprints. And blueprints are interesting, you've definitely uh, used one before. These mostly look like JavaScript, but you'll notice the ERB-like syntax, the embedded Ruby-like syntax, where you can put these, um, I don't even know what you call these, arrow, percent, equal, uh, and, and these will uh, be used by Ember CLI to dynamically inject uh, different things uh, into these files when they're generated from this blueprint. Uh, you can also look th these up on the Ember CLI docs. Uh, these template variables are provided to you by default, uh, but you can also define your own in your add-on, which is very useful if your add-on is extensible in some way. One thing else to note about Nodeland is that you get access to the add-on hooks in the index of your uh, add-on. And these let you work with the add-ons build directly. And you can do a lot of things here, like include custom Ember CLI commands, you can include, choose files to include, to exclude, you can add preprocessors, and so on. So let's go through some of, uh, some examples of add-ons that make use of these hooks and see how they use them to do the, the features that they include. Uh, Ember Test Selectors is a really great add-on by the folks at Simple Labs, uh, the same people behind Ember Simple Auth. And what this add-on does is let you define a data test selector attribute on your HTML elements. And then this test selector can be used in your tests uh, to select elements. But the cool thing about this add-on is that it will actually strip these data test selectors away in uh, environments that you tell it to. So you don't have to p pollute your production HTML with unnecessary attributes. And to do this, Ember Test Selectors uses two main Ember CLI hooks. So first, it has a preprocessor to walk the tree, and then it finds and removes uh, those data test selectors from your template. These test selectors are very useful, again, you know, instead of selecting something by its class or its ID or whatever other attribute, which can be very brittle, if you, for example, you know, you change the, the, st uh, the, the class name because of, of the styling, then it's really good because the test selector is decoupled from the presentation. Ember Test Selectors also has, uh, makes use of the tree for add-on hook in order to remove itself from the build if the test selectors are being stripped out. After all, the add-on becomes unnecessary in production, right, because, uh, you know, if you're stripping out HTML, why do you need test selectors? So it will actually remove itself from your application and it won't bloat the final production asset. And then Ember Composable Helpers is an add-on I co-authored with Martin uh, while I was at Dockyard. It's a relatively large library that includes a lot of helpers, and it doesn't really make sense to include all of them if you're only using like one or two in your application. So we use the same uh, hook as well to include or exclude specific helpers from your application. In the add-on, uh, the tree for add-on hook will call a filter helpers method, which then uses this regular expression to test what file names it needs to include or exclude. And then based on configuration in the consuming application, we can, we can say like, oh right, I only need helper X, Y, Z, and I can just remove everything else because we're not using them. And finally, Ember CI Deploy is an add-on that, uh, that we use a lot in, at Netflix. Uh, it, it makes use of custom commands to give you a really nice interface uh, in which you can deploy your applications from the command line. And the nice thing about this is it will act, it actually helps you make your deploys automatable. So you can have, for example, you know, uh, a CI build deploy an application after a test suite runs or whatever else. And custom commands are really simple to add to an add-on. Uh, Ember CLI deploy defines them in a separate folder, which also is a, a nice way of just separating it out and not having this massive index.js file in your add-on. So I've written a couple add-ons now. And throughout the experience, I've learned a thing or two, a few hacks here and there that I want to share, but uh, don't use the hacks. So first, I want to talk about the developer experience. You know, it's really important to think about how others will use your add-on as you build it. First, in your documentation, it's, it's super useful to describe why the add-on exists and why it does, and what it does, right? That's, 
That's something that's actually missing from a lot of add-ons, like what does this add-on even do? Why, why does this exist? Tell people, it's really important. And you don't need to write an essay worthy of thought leadership. Um, it's, it's just, just describe it simply. Just, just a, a little bit of explanation goes a long way in helping people understand the goals of your add-on, how it helps them solve a problem, and how they can even contribute and make your add-on better. Next, it might be obvious, but you should explain in detail how someone might use your add-on. Uh, again, this doesn't need to be a fancy website. Uh, and depending on the kind of add-on you're writing, uh, this might make sense for like library kind of uh, utility add-ons. Uh, I will typically detail how to use the public API for an add-on uh, in ways that I anticipate their use. So, you know, this gives like a simple example of how you use this feature to do some, like the 80% use case. And I take inspiration from documentation like uh, from libraries like Lodash and Ramda, for example, but uh, this doesn't really work for all add-ons. Uh, you know, it really depends on the kind of add-on you're building. Uh, you know, if your add-on introduces a new way of thinking, like Ember Concurrency, for example, then this kind of documentation isn't enough and you definitely need to explain your ideas more. And if you do have the time for it, it can be very effective to create live examples of how to use your add-on. Uh, this shows off your add-on directly and gives people more confidence that they'll be able to use your add-on to solve your problem. So here's a really nice uh, real example on the Ember Concurrency website. Are you sick of Ember Concurrency? <laughs> And it's even more appropriate when your add-on is presentational. So for example, Ember Burger Menu, the demo site and documentation site, literally dog foods the add-on right there, which is awesome. And Ember Power Select, again, also does a really great job here. You can actually try it out in the docs itself. But if your add-on isn't presentational or if you're lazy like me and you don't want to put together a whole like fancy site, you can use Ember Twiddle, which is really great. Um, uh, I think, I'm not sure when, but Ember Twiddle now has add-on support, so you can actually install an add-on into a Twiddle, which is awesome. Thanks to all the Ember Twiddle people. Uh, and personally, I like this a lot because it becomes a live playground that you can share and people can actually try out your add-on and like, you know, edit a little bit and see if it, if it works for their use case. And this is actually kind of like try before you buy, right? Another thing that seems obvious is that your add-on needs meaningful tests. Uh, the good news is that Ember makes your life relatively easy now, thanks to all the awesome Ember CLI folks. Uh, for example, by default, your add-on will run tests against different versions of Ember. This is all by default, you don't have to do anything. Uh, you know, but in some cases, if your add-on explicitly needs to support, you know, like a really old version of Ember or a very specific version of Ember with some weird edge case, then you can actually test that explicitly in the Ember try config. Uh, um, and yeah, this is really useful. And if you also use Travis CI, which is free for open source libraries, then you can make use of the build matrix, which will let you specify of different variants of the build to test uh, in parallel, which is really nice. And you can even also specify uh, which uh, of these builds are allowed to fail. So, you know, if you see at the bottom, I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, Ember Canary scenario is allowed to fail. And this should give you and your users more confidence that your add-on works as expected in different versions of Ember. Uh, additionally, it's also possible to test your add-on and your application against a real browser. Um, there are various ways to do this. Uh, for example, in the future, you might actually use headless Chrome instead of normal Chrome. Uh, and there are a lot of add-ons that actually do this. So you can check out their Travis uh, configs, for example. Now, one more thing that's crucial for a lot of add-ons is uh, the ability to configure them in some way. And this is one area where I feel it's not super straightforward and there are a lot of ways to do so, but I don't think it's documented very well. So the first method uh, is one that I saw was adopted by Liquidfire. So in Liquidfire, there is this file called a transition map, which looks very similar to a route map. Uh, and you place this file in the app folder of your app. And somehow, magically, it knows how to pick this transition uh, file up without you doing any other work. And this is really nice because it makes configuration quite painless. So let's look at this transition map a little closer. So what is it? It just looks like a really simple export of a function, right? And somehow this function's context, you know, the this keyword, you know, it, it, it knows how to define transitions, it knows how to define all these other really nice uh, DSLs, uh, very similar to Ember's router. And Liquidfire makes use of the Ember resolver to locate this file and then invoke the function with the new context applied to it. 
And this is slightly intimate API here, so I kept it small. Uh, but you can see that this, these three basic files, app.js, resolver, and router.js, um, you actually can locate them with the factory with um, their magic incantations. And factory four is a new feature. I think it's already in Ember. But uh, if you're supporting an older version of Ember, you can use the Ember factory four polypool, so you don't have to use that intimate API that I just showed you. Now, there is nothing special about, there's nothing special about the transition app, for example. Uh, it exports just like any other JavaScript file in Ember. And that means in your scenario, if you're making an add-on, you could say, you could tell your users to export a plain object. You can export whatever they want, uh, whatever you want, and then your add-on can look for that file and then pick it up and do the configuration there. So uh, it doesn't have to be a function like in Liquidfire. That's just the way Liquidfire decided to do it so that they could have a nice DSL. Next, you can also have your user define their configuration in the config environment file. Uh, this is generally an older practice, but I think it still remains useful where you want your users to be able to configure your add-on uh, differently in various environments. So, for example, Ember Metrics is an add-on I wrote that uh, gives you a nice API on top of various analytics services like Google Analytics, Mixpanel, so forth. So you can actually track events uh, with or page views with one API instead of having to call like five different services in your application. And in this case, it's actually really useful for us to be able to do things differently based on the environment that the application is uh, being built in. So you know you, you might not actually want your development environment like you're just clicking around and drop down a hundred times to trigger production analytics because your marketing team will be like, wow, we're getting a lot of use, but it's actually just you. Um, and config, so configuration environment, that file seems like a really great choice for this add-on. And Ember Metrics installs an initializer into the application that imports this config file, uh, sorry, the configuration, and then registers it uh, in the container as config colon metrics. And then that object is in injected into the metric service so that the service can access the configuration. Now in the service, you can just access it like any other property, just like this get options, and you got your options, awesome. Uh, note that this is all defined in Ember Metrics itself, so the, the consuming app doesn't need to do anything else, uh, so this is really convenient. And another popular option is to make use of the Ember CLI build file, and this is a good way to allow configuration that happens at build time. So uh, again, Ember Composable Helpers comes with a lot of helpers, as its name suggests, but uh, you don't want to bring in everything, so we let you configure it here, where you can say, like, I only want the increment helper, I only want decrement, but accept pipe. Yeah, you're not supposed to use them both at the same time, but this is an example. <laughs> uh, and yeah, this is all handled in the add-ons index file, so the included hook lets you modify what goes in the build, uh, you can whitelist and blacklist, and then uh, if you have those functions return new broccoli trees, then you can, you can exclude or include those helpers. And then depending on the kind of add-on, it might also make sense for, to allow users to extend it based on their needs. So again, with the Ember metrics examples, it ships with some uh, bundled adapters for different services like Mixpanel and Google Annex, but it doesn't define like an adapter for every single thing. And the idea is that um, with extensibility, we allow users to define their own adapters so you can write an adapter for your application against your you know, your bespoke analytics service or something else that we didn't build. And then it, it, this is also nice because it also strips away the adapters that you don't use. And these adapters are just plain Ember objects under the hood, um, except that the service, the metric service, expects them to implement some specific interface. Uh, one thing to note about this approach, though, is that these plain Ember objects are not managed by Ember's container. Uh, and what that means is that you have to manage their lifecycle yourself. Uh, so you gotta delete them, or sorry, destroy them, you gotta initialize them, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then here, you know, like in, in Ember, metrics, Ember Metrics example, we have a base adapter that all adapters inherit from. It doesn't really do anything but throw errors if you don't define the required method. And then each adapter will just implement those methods and you can start using it in your application. But the interesting part is in the service itself where we need, we need, so even though if you created an adapter, the metric service doesn't know that your adapter exists in your application, so we need a way for the service to discover them, and uh, essentially what Ember Metrics does is it uses the names that you specify in the configuration, and then it, it tries to look it up. 
uh, first in your application and then in the add-on. So again, so you can override uh, the Google Analytics adapter, for example, if you don't like the base implementation. And once you have a reference to that uh, adapter factory, then you can, the, the service can now just instantiate these objects at will, you know, and, and, and delete them and so forth. Um, and yeah, that's a pretty nice way to do it. Okay, and then there's the approach where you operate outside of Ember. Uh, this is the dangerous part. So note that I don't recommend this approach, but I just wanna talk about it. Uh, so in Ember Chainset Validations, uh, which is a validation library, uh, validators and validation maps are plain functions and objects. They're not Ember objects. So what that means is that we don't get access to the container. And so to allow our users to override validation messages like the defaults, we had to rely on a little hack. And I kept this font size small, so don't read it. Again, I don't recommend this approach, but um, in, in certain cases, you know, like hacks are useful, right? Uh, yeah, don't do this. And yeah, and, like, again, like in certain cases, hacks are useful. Um, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of Ember, a lot of Ember and Ember CLI started out as hacks, but in, in a way, hacks allow uh, library authors to, to determine like what the optimal API should be, and <laughs> I can see Rob laughing. Um, but yeah, sometimes hacks are okay, but at your own risk. Another way to provide extensibility is the approach that Ember Service Worker does. Um, so Ember Service Worker, the base add-on, doesn't really do anything except take care of some basic infrastructure. And then uh, in order to actually get some service worker functionality into your application, you need to install plugins. Um, and you know, these plugins all do different things. Uh, so how Ember Service Worker does this, it looks at the Ember Service Worker plugin keyword in the add-on. So it actually can look at the add-ons, uh, these plugin add-ons uh, package JSON file and determine if this is a plugin that it needs to then initialize and install as a service worker. And then in the add-ons post-process step, it will find those plugins, it discovers them, and then it registers them in your browser. And, and actually, this is actually a really nice approach for add-ons that are extensible. It's a nice way where uh, people can extend your add-on without any effort on your part, and um, it all just works. So as you can see, the more you know about the internal workings of Ember and Ember CLI, the more features you can take advantage of in, to use in your add-on. And there are a number of ways to do that, but personally, my favorite is to always keep this application open. It's called Dash. It's an offline documentation app. It's a really nice search feature. I have it open 100% of the time when I'm working, and it's really easy to just look stuff up, and it's not Ember specific. And again, there are many ways to get acquainted with the internal guts of Ember, but I like this approach because you start from the public API you're familiar with, and then you can start digging deeper and see how the framework actually implements something. So as a simple example, I was digging through the source for Ember set, the, um, that you, I discovered this uh, unknown property and set unknown property, which is very similar to Ruby's method missing. And there are actually a lot of add-ons that make use of this like hidden feature uh, as a way to intercept sets on objects. So there's definitely a lot of benefits into learning how the framework is implemented. Uh, and there are always people on Slack who are very eager to help you understand uh, the inner workings of Ember. And you, you never know, you might discover something interesting that you can make an add-on around. So those are just some of the interesting pieces of Ember I discovered when making add-ons and studying other people's add-ons. And there's definitely a lot more to discover, so I hope I've motivated you enough to start digging deeper and uh, you know, maybe write an add-on of your own for your, for your team. But stepping back from the tactical stuff for a moment, add-ons are ultimately about open source. And when you write your first add-on, open source feels really scary. You know, your code's gonna be like live for everyone to see and criticize. But don't let that stop you. You know, your add-on, your first add-on doesn't need to be amazing, and you should at least give it a try, even if it's really, really simple. If you do enough of it, you'll get a feel for it. Uh, personally, my Ember was my first introduction to authoring and maintaining open source libraries. I think my first add-on was Ember CLI Flash, and I remember when I first open sourced it, I was really embarrassed by it. And if you do this even more, you become more confident and level up quicker. You know, open source teaches you a lot, you know, not just on the technical side of things, but also in terms of your communication skills. So as engineers, we might tend to focus too much on the nitty gritty details, and we forget that ultimately we work with people, you know, real life people. So sometimes our communication skills can tend to suffer. 
And finally, <laughs> if you do open source long enough, you could be this person and write your own JavaScript framework. All right, so at some point or rather in your open source career, you, you, you know, you're gonna get to the stage where you can no longer devote all your time, your free time to a single open source library. And in those scenarios, it's actually really important to be able to relinquish control and, and trust other people to step up and maintain your add-on uh, in your place. And maintaining, if you ever have the scenario where you, like, you, know, you inherited a very popular open source library or if, if your library becomes very popular, then you will find that it's actually very exhausting to maintain. Uh, you know, people are opening issues, they're like yelling at you, they're calling your names. And it's very common to feel frustrated uh, and sometimes you might even grow to hate working on this library because people can be quite toxic. And in those scenarios, it's really important to know when to disconnect. People will say mean things about you, for sure. They will make, say mean things about your code, they will, they will you know, make personal attacks against you. Now this is by no means normal, and uh, it's not something we should tolerate, but it does happen. And again, when you start working in open source, this technical part of it is only probably half the challenge. And finally, if you do decide to start in the scary world of open source, please adopt Semver. Thankfully, we have tools to make it all easier. Uh, and uh, you know, be a good open source citizen. All right, we've talked a lot about a lot today. We first, we looked at what the major differences are between an add-on and an app. We learned that the add-on folder is the guts and the app folder is what's merged into the consuming application. Add-on hooks are really powerful, so do check them out. Then we talked about different approaches to managing the developer experience. Good documentation is really important as well as meaningful tests. And you might wanna take some time to think about how your add-on can be configured, how it can be extended by other people. And finally, remember that open source is not just about the code. I hope my talk will motivate you to get, get out there and enter the scary world of open source. You can reach out to me on Twitter, or you can look, at, uh, look for me after the break if you have any questions. Thank you all for listening, you've been great.